Thank you both very much for joining me on our project called Speaking Truth to Youth. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say about you and about Becky, who's a very popular portrait in our collection. What gave Becky the inspiration, energy, and focus to pursue her love of theater and life, it seems? I'm going to wheel it back just a little bit more to 1981. She was actually born in 74, and this is in England, of course. In 1981, the man on trial was a doctor accused of terminating the life of a Mongol child on humanitarian grounds. His philosophy, as described by the prosecution, was that such a child, having been rejected by his parents, was better off dead. At the outset of the trial, the judge asked the jury of 12 ordinary men and women whether they had ever had any dealings with handicapped children and whether any of them had any personal experience of them in any form at all. It was only after he had received assurance in the negative to both these questions that he allowed the scene to proceed. It was then against this background of ignorance and inexperience that many examples of prejudice and reckless inaccuracy about the handicap were expressed and accepted. But the reason we came we stayed in this country was because of that things were so so backward in England with regards to um, mainstreaming yes mainstreaming that's the world that Becky was born into her poem of herself is I have a dream that can open your eyes I believe that a dream never dies I dream of a world where all people can be free overweight people and gay people and people like me I am a king sitting on my throne. All people like me have Down syndrome. If you have people picking on you, oh, what can you do? Oh, what can you do? So what if you're overweight or if you are gay? Just turn away, just turn away. If that person wants a fight, you can just hold on tight. If they start to call you names, you will not play their silly games. We are the people that can fight back and leave those other people on that same track. We are the people of a different kind and learn to let those people unwind. It doesn't matter if you're white or black. Tell those other people they need never come back, but say that you will be their friend and that this friendship whew, won't never end. So she wow. came into that world of incredible prejudice, particularly a doctor, a, a homeopathic, naturopathic doctor who said to us when she was born and the regular doctors said get rid of her get rid of her she's no good and he said see her for who she is so that was the most helpful thing and that's the message that i would love to pass on to you know any young person any young parent or child or whatever i think it's common practice now isn't it I imagine that you, if you have a children, a child with Down syndrome or any child with a handicap, you, you do accept them for who they are and you, you give them as much stimulus as possible, which is what we were told to do. We just gave Becky as much stimulation and as much encouragement and, and just stretched her as much as we could, you know, into, and it was mostly a lot of fun. And of course, it's very relevant at the moment with yeah. the whole racism thing you know and and really helping young people to see what what this prejudice is about and it's it's difficult it's very difficult stuff to get at what what is it that makes somebody not normal and when we came to this country um very quickly we became very connected to a company called Shakespeare and Company which is in the Berkshires, the Berkshires. theatre was in her her Blood she day. was always always verbal, I suppose. Physically, she was limited because of the hole in her, her heart. She was 10 when she came over, and um, I remember her standing on that outdoor stage, and the play that they were doing at summer was Midsummer Night's Dream. And I remember just her one afternoon just standing on that stage, and she'd memorised the whole of Puck's last speech. She just did it. What we learned from this is... is the, the environment that the child comes into, you know, and, and what's fun and what's, what the parents think is fun is, 
so important. Becky would go into um, just some sort of alternative fantasy land and she would have dialogues with herself. When, and when her friend came around, they would just act out whole fantasies, whole play. She wrote a lot of plays. When we went to Syracuse University, um, we lived on Buckingham Avenue. Becky was really into theater, so she would write this play. I was involved in a production of Hamlet at the, at the drama department. And Becky came to see every dress rehearsal and every performance. And then she went home and wrote her version of Hamlet, which was wonderful because when she could remember some of the lines, but of course, when she didn't, she just made it up. And, <laughs> but she did get the plot almost right. So I think that was the first play that the Buckingham players, because the Buckingham players consisted of the neighbors and, and a few friends, who Becky would go around and knock on people's doors and say, oh, we're doing this on Saturday afternoon and I want you to play Claudius. You need to dress up. So people would come on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> to where we're living with in, in costume and that they'd be given the script and they would read it through and then we would sort of do it like a sort of stage reading. And, it, and Becky wrote, we did a version of Peter and the Wolf. She wrote a th murder mysteries, you know, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And I said to her one day, she was writing, and I said, I said, how's it going to end, Becky? And she said, I don't know, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> What's blossomed into other manifestations is the, is the starting of the, the drama group at the drama department, where drama students worked with special needs kids, you know, on a Monday night. And that started. And Lizzie and Becky started that really together with, with together with a student who was very, very keen on doing it. Yeah, and that's still that's, going. It's still going, wonderful. and it's, it's spawned. They've got, they've got five, five groups in New York, and it's and, called CoLab, the ones in New York. And they've got, and Seattle, and um, of course, two in, two in Syracuse. What guidance did you have or need to support all of these pursuits? We'd been guided by this extraordinary doctor to begin with to not see the problem not see the the label yes see the the, the human being that and to talk always talk to them based on these experiences and your experiences as parents and educators what advice do you have for young people see the person for who they are yeah. as an individual not for the label so you want to always let the person reveal who they are rather than try and teach them or try and impose stuff on them. I remember saying I would never, I would never go back and I'd just do it all over again. I would never wish that we didn't have had Becky. Well, I suppose it and sort of shaped, shaped who we are, who we are. Becky was a sort of guinea pig for the London area. From uh, They called it mainstreaming. And when she came out of the primary school, then she had to go to a, the middle school, which was not special, not um, mainstream. She lasted three weeks. People who, ha you know, who have those disabilities, it's not good to, just to put them all in one group no. and separate them from the rest of the world. They need to be integrated. In Massachusetts, where we were living at the time, the special ed people were saying, yes, they were, they, <laughs> that, they, that's were, a given. they were mainstreaming kids. And that's one of the reasons we stayed in yes. Syracuse. One of the reasons we stayed was because the, the special ed department at Syracuse University was pretty high powered. And they had a scheme going with the elementary schools where special needs kids, they were integrated into regular classes with extra help. That elementary school education was terrific. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This has been really fun. <laughs>